I have some new work in bronze. This is the debut of this body of work. Um, and then I have drawings in ink. Um, working in caustic, which is all this mushroomy looking stuff. Um, these magnetic field fossils, which are made of iron and acrylic. And I have these sort of sound wave paintings in the back here. So these are all um, use different processes, but like I, I hope people are able to see the connections visually between them, because I sort of see them all as connected and you know, um, visually similar and, and of sort of the same stuff. So um, how it's made, these, these pieces are um, mostly ballpoint pen and sharpie, and I like draw a grid with uh, a straight edge, so it looks like a piece of graph paper, and that's like the initial stage of that process, and then I um, uh, drop it in a pool of solvent, isopropyl alcohol or acetone, and the solvent um, dissolves in inks and brings them up and it distorts the image of the grid. Um, sort of like watercolor, but I'm not um, ever manipulating it myself. Like it, it just gets dropped in the pool and then I leave the room. And the next day I come back and they sort of compose themselves. And each one is completely unique and I've never seen a repeat with these. So that's really fun. It's like a really fun way to work because it's, it's an awesome surprise to wake up in the morning and be like, let's go look at my art. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's just sort of made itself, so that's, that's like really fun. It's a fun way to work. And there are a lot of artists who've like worked in that sort of way over time, but this is a process that's unique to me. This is something I discovered and have been experimenting with. Um, and I also think, you know, these are sort of like, they document like their own creation and sort of like all of the work in here is like that as well. So these paintings um, are sort of uh, an older design of mine. I took my first painting class in 2012 at Oberlin and I found that I really didn't like painting with a brush. It sort of tedious to me and I was having a hard time sort of translating what was in my head onto the paper or canvas. And I wanted to make a ton of lines, colored lines, because I like colored lines. And doing that with a brush is like, just it's, it's really boring, it's not fun, and it's really difficult. So I started to like think of other ways that I could apply paint to surfaces, and I discovered sort of the elastic band was awesome way to make a ton of lines and paint really quick. So these these have thousands of lines in them and the elastic band is like sort of like a bow and arrow. It's, there's a nail in the center of my easel and then the elastic band is tied around the nail and drawing attention and then I just, you know. So Do you play it on the surface or like shoot Yeah, it's like it's like shot, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's really fun, it's a fun way to paint, and you can get results a lot faster than if you use a brush where you would be like, you know, it'd be a lot of work to do that. I mean, it's, it's, there's still a lot of work, but it would be impossible to do with a brush. And then <clears throat> these encaustic pieces that look like fungus or coral or bacteria or sometimes like aerial landscape views of forests or geography, um, those are made of encaustic, and encaustic is one of the oldest um, painting formats in the world. It's a combination of beeswax and Damar resin. Um, it was discovered on Egyptian sarcophaguses and Greek ships, and stuff like that. It's very durable, lasts forever, um, and I saw its potential as sculptural medium and I noticed that it was very textural. And since it's wax, and wax cools off very quickly from a liquid to a solid, it's really good for layering. So I use a brush and I do tons and tons of layers to build up those textures, which at a certain point stop becoming a texture and start becoming forms, sculptural forms. So 
that's what's going on there. <laughs> and the pieces in the back that look like sound waves are the elastic band technique again, but instead of being parallel or being perpendicular to the surface, they go parallel. So they're snapped in parallel like, like this, you know, and it oscillates across the surface, depositing paint, you know, at different points. And I do that a number of times so that you can sort of see like a time-based representation of what vibration looks like. So what am I missing? Okay. These pieces, the magnetic field fossils, um, really interested in sort of exposing these unseen forces that surround us, like magnetic fields, sound waves, radio waves, stuff like that. So um, I tracked down a supplier for iron filings, and I use iron filings, and I homogenize it with acrylic paint, and I think of the filings sort of like pixels, and um, I have a very strong rare earth magnet that I put underneath the kennel at the bottom, and um, and so that, that material like sort of is all you know trying to get to the center of like where the magnetic field is strongest, and so it stacks up on top of itself, and the magnetic field is almost like the armature for the sculpture that creates an architecture, and it maps sort of this imploding force that is magnetism, and then <clears throat> they're baked so the paint dries and it sets all the iron filings in place when the magnets are removed. So these are no longer magnetized, but at one point they were. So that's why they're called <coughs> fossils. So. Are you dripping the filings onto it from above? <clears throat> Those are all done upside down. I built a jig that the magnet atta attaches to, and then um, I like you know have a cup of the mixture, and it just sucks it onto there, and then you can sort of, I have a chopstick, I sort of tease it, you know, so that it, <laughs> so that it sort of organizes itself around this very strong magnetic field from below, from below yeah, so, um, because the magnetic force is so much stronger than gravity, gravity is actually pretty weak, so, um, that is sort of what's going on there, so. If anyone has any questions, let's well, open up the floor. Yeah, the bronze is, are basically like the encaustic stuff, but they're super built up, and anything you can make in wax, you can investment mold in bronze. So I have a foundry in Cleveland that I work with, who and are awesome, and I bring them a wax sculpture, and they give me an exact copy of it in bronze, like a couple weeks later. And um, there's some finishing work involved that they need to be sandblasted and ground down, and um, and then I use a blowtorch to anneal them, which is how they get these um, nice reds, purples, blues, silvers, um, and there are natural oils in the bronze, and those when are when they're superheated spread out over the surface and they refract light like an oil slick in a parking lot, and so that's where we get this color. It's not actually pigmented or painted. It's almost like an optical illusion of oils that come the surface. Chris? What about the towers? Uh, the towers are, you know, they're just sort of um, like further exploration and like sort of the sculptural potential of the encaustic stuff because, you know, they, they look cool flat, but I'm, I'm realizing, you know, that they also function really well as like, you know, 3D stuff. And so the towers are sort of my experiment, seeing like where we can take the 3D element for the encaustic stuff. Why are they all the same, uh, same size, the same, uh, you know, they're all cross-section. Yeah, yeah, cross-sections all an inch and a half. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's two by two pine scraps from my studio. That's what I have around, and that's what I want to try out. So, yeah. so when you took your first class, you immediately started
Yes. So there, you're starting off painting, doing something like that, that style is the first style in painting. Right. So I think that's a great question. Um, I think that's a great question. I uh, I think that has a little bit to do with like the nature of the program I was in at Oberlin because I didn't get a BFA, I got a BA. So it's not a Bachelor of Fine Arts, it's a Bachelor of Arts, just like you would get in history or something like that. So when you get a BFA, you have to take figure drawing and all these you know sort of core classes, industrial design, stuff that I literally would not have been able to sit through because it's so boring. Who don't care. Like, and at this point in our artistic lexicon, these things are sort of irrelevant, but all these students are forced to take them anyway because yeah. someone said that they had to because it's this tradition. So I, I think in many ways it's valid, but for a lot of people that just does not work. And for me, it would not have worked. And so I, <laughs> I just dove into like having fun in the studio because to me that's that's what was important, that's what was yielding the visually interesting results. Because like to this day, I, I cannot draw something in perspective or you know, a, a person, like you know, if you're in a museum sketching with David or whatever, mine looks really bad, so. <laughs> Sarah. Um, how do you go through your colors? Like, what is the Well, red, yeah, red is, is cool, but it's a very aggressive color, and so I've always sort of, you know, struggled with red. Um, you don't see a lot of it in my work. But uh, I studied with an awesome colorist at Oberlin. His name is John Pearson. He's a um, sort of important British minimalist. And he studied with Joseph Albers at Yale. Um, so I'm sort of like third generation Albers colorist. And so, um, but why I choose these colors, I, I don't know. You know, the, the trend in art now is to be colorless, and also in interior design and stuff, everything's gray and sort of bleak. So this is sort of like in opposition to all of that stuff. I like bright colors, and I'm interested in the harmony of colors too. And you know, with these drawings, the colors are sort of generative, like they're they're decided by the chemical process instead of like my own sort of ideas about what they should be like, and then these are the same, you know, I have a little bit of control over the colors of the bronze, but that's also a chemical reaction, so, all right. You talked about what motivated you to do the, um, the rubber band things work, but what was the driving force and, and what was the, what kind of got you the idea of the, the grid work? Oh, great question. I uh, I think again that was just I was playing around with stuff. I was like trying different combinations of, of vertices and like you know placement for this stuff. And I think one day I was like, well, what if I just try four vertices, one at each side of the canvas that radiate 180 degrees? Like I felt would probably look pretty cool. And it, it looked a lot more organized than I was expecting. So, and you'll see this is a theme like throughout my entire portfolio. It's like, like, you know, I have an idea, maybe it'll work, but I try it. And instead of talking myself out of it, I try it out. And, and for the grids, what, what, decide, what made you put those into a solvent? Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I was playing around in my studio with different chemicals because it's art and it's a lot of it's basic chemistry. Um, but I was also uh, in, in sixth grade science class, we learned about chromatography, which is the forensic science process of separating like inks from letters at crime scenes. So you can match the inks in different crime scenes. So if that makes sense, we use capillary action which is um, the property for liquid to move through like tiny tubes. And paper is made of a bunch of tiny fibrous tubes. So I knew that you could take black ink, which is not actually black, it's every color mixed together. Um, and you can separate it using water, which is a solvent. 
But I was like, what if we use something more powerful, like isopropyl alcohol or acetone, to separate these colors and then blur these out? So that's how I sort of first started doing these. And they used to be a little bit more like expressionist with like just blobs of color. And they were a little more watercolory. But then I started to realize that the grid was sort of like a control. You know, it's this very rigid sort of form and image. And you can really see like where it travels in a different way than if it was just like marks that were some more random. So I, just, I, I wanted to take like the most rigid, the most right angles thing so that you could really see like where the ink was traveling and, and how it was interacting with the chemical process. So, yes. so what, what solvents should I use to dip my diplomas? Your what, sorry? What solvent should I use to dip my diplomas? <laughs> Uh, methyl ethyl ketone <laughs> petroleum ether or something that'll really destroy it. <laughs> yes. Now, um, the second one from the right, the green one, I clearly see the profile of a woman with her head yes. back, oh. medium length hair. Do you see that? Yeah. I'm that? getting into you just right. said that. Oh, now I can't unsee it. Is that <laughs> sort of intervention in the composition of these. So I I like have no idea how they're gonna come out. It sounds like it's sort of got kind of like a Rorschach thing going on. Yes. Yeah. Where it's this thing that just happens sort of at random, but then you're able to project all this stuff onto it, you know, that you're feeling or, you know, um she's beautiful. See <laughs> so, so how much selection do you do with that process? You know, do you do you know, 100 of these and pick out 60 you like, or, so, or is it is this really a higher yield process than that? Um, I, my studio has a really high success rate. There's almost no waste. I used for this every drawing wow. that I made, except for one, but so that's because it was really red. <laughs> that have faces in them or something like that. You're pretty much seeing everything. This is what we, what, this is what we It's That's pretty cool. unedited, you know, nice. this, this whole thing. So, yes? I'm curious if um, there's anything systematic in the way that you placed the paper grid into the solvent. Because um, like with actual chromatography, you're always trying not to get wavy lines, <laughs> right, to separate mm -hmm. the size. But so yeah. it's really, so, um, were you, so like I noticed in this one, it, there's a lot more straight lines and others are more wavy. So did you vary your technique in placing the paper there? Um, that's sort of an intuitive process. I, I do it in this you know abandoned storage closet in my building. And I do it in a different place every time, but I try and always use the same amount of solvent. I just sort of feel it out, I'll be like, <laughs> that spot feels right, and then you know I do it. The floor is uneven too, so like you know I can't I can't really predict like what what's really going to happen, but like it's just sort of like I, I put some intention into placement, but not with any idea of like what it's going to do. I just sort of feel it out. And, it's not a bad. Yeah. Is it, or is it, it, is, it is like a puddle. A puddle. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How long's your lease? <laughs> My building was just bought by a multinational, multi billion dollar developer, and we are on month to month. So, oh, boy. Yeah. Keep doing stuff. Very. So, Matt, the encaustics like that size, you said you do it with a paintbrush. Are you doing like a big paintbrush and you're going along, or is this like you? It's a four inch brush, so these are happening in batches. You know, I'm not doing each one individually. And what's it start as? Like, do you, do you create bumps along the bottom? Do you drip and then you, like? That's a great question. It starts, it starts as a wood panel, mm -hmm. and I put a layer down. 
and the loop panel has pores and natural sort of inconsistencies in the surface. Sometimes I sand with sandpaper a little bit. Um, so, you know, the material will sink into some pores and have some natural hills and valleys, and I just build on those. Really? It's painted on, just long strokes. So then, then how do you get the, the um, um, low spots? So, in, you know, in, in the original surface, in the original coat I put down, there are naturally occurring hills and valleys. And then I add to the hills and the valleys just to look. So, so why are the bumps so high? So why are the bumps so relatively uh, evenly spaced? I guess I figured you were dipping it into a puddle of, of molten wax and pull it up or something like that. To, yeah. To let it. Um, I, I don't really know. That's where the sort of mysterious <coughs> element of this stuff comes in. I, I can't really explain why that is. Yeah. It's just sort of the way it wants to look. <laughs> and it's consistent. You can see. I, like, I, I know. That's why so. I, I was trying to understand. Do you put those bumps there yourself? No. Do you put the paint or just an extra? No. How does your um, exposure of music and sound as it all this? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, does this influence that? Does that influence this? How does, yes. do you listen to your own music while you're doing this process? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, listen, I listen to Neil Young. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> some, sometimes birds and squirrels. <laughs> School, or uh, I've been digging silence in the studio lately too. But um, yeah, I I've always wanted to see sound. I've always wanted to. So that's that's a big sort of connection here with these pieces, especially in the back, or even these. You know, I that's the connection there. I wouldn't say there's so much a connection with this stuff, like aesthetically. But like my music is also generated by use numbers and formulas to create my music, you know, sort of the same way I used to design these experiments. So, Laura. Um, so, which of these take the longest for you to create? And second is, do you have a personal favorite? Great questions. Um, I think. It is, it is hard. Each each one sort of, they all take a while, just in that, um, you know, there's framing and presentation. You have to build the panels for them, all that stuff. That the actual making of the pieces can take a while too. I'd say those large ones over there probably are the largest investment of time, just because there's so much surface area and so much layering that has to go on. Does it go over like weeks, months? I think like a one really focused work day will produce one of those pieces. So if I spend ten hours in the studio, really in the zone with one of those, then that's I can get it done that quickly. Yes. Here's another similar question. Um, this encaustic piece on the trip foot over there. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in how uncannily similar the little pieces are to like a shelf length. Something on a tree trunk. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Or, um, I mean, it's uncanny. Like it's really weird, right? <laughs> when I when I first discovered that too, I was like, oh, shit. Like, this is insane. <laughs> you know, this looks just like these turkey tail mushrooms I see in the forest. But my theory behind that is, is that <coughs> these are basically just repetitious, and these all these organic life forms are created through cell division, just copies of copies of copies. And really repetitive processes will yield organic forms. Julie. Is the, um, the
again, like these, I'm trying to bring these sort of out into the world a little bit more. So, Jean? So, um, I love, love the bus reference and the way that helps, and it just occurred to me that, you know, mycelium is all about what's sort of running the, 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 the fungus, uh, the bus reference about the fruit. What's really happening is the mycelium is, is, is running. So it made me think whether or not had you ever tried to attach trays or have, you know, something undercurrent running to then create different things simultaneously. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I'm, I'm very inspired by mycelium and they are the original internet, so I don't know. I you know that's like maybe a future project, but you know, right now this is this is coming from above. This stuff is right. it's being added from above instead of from below. So right, or even in the in the bats, if you had two bats connected, I, I don't know. It just it's, it's a different it's just the concept of the organic nature of things, you know, connecting and letting things you know develop on their own. I, don't know. Just, I think it's a great just, idea. Just the only thing that can truly develop on its own is, is life, you know? Otherwise, all of this stuff, like, it, it does need some amount of intervention by me. Will? Yeah, man, so um, I know that you said you kind of like having the bronze, how it has sort of its own control, and you have some minor sort of control over what it does. Have you ever thought of getting into, like, bio art kind of stuff? Totally. Like, do you mean, like, designing, like? Like, using living things to kind of create art. Yeah, there's there's an artist in Cleveland I really like named Liz Burgess, and she collaborates with these silkworms. Mm -hmm. That's such a beautiful project. Like she builds she builds these structures and stuff for the worms to hang out in, and they build their webs around it and their cocoons inside it, and, um, and then you know when they turn into moths or whatever. Like and she, you know, um, the cycle sort of continues, but then she's left with this beautiful sculpture that has been sort of woven by these worms, so I really like her stuff, and I'm interested in that, yeah, totally, but I, I haven't really tried anything like it, Yeah. So. Yes? How, how sturdy are these encaustic panels? Could you, like, put them on a wall, use it as a wall covering? Um, they, they hang on the wall, no problem. I, I wouldn't drop them, you know, they're, they're pretty delicate. Yeah. Uh, they'll hang on a wall, no problem, but you know, when I was when I was driving these here from Cleveland, ten hours over, you know, all these roads covered in potholes and stuff. I was very nervous, but I had, I had pillows underneath them, and then pillows on top, and then I ratchet strap down. So they made the trip in one piece, and I was amazed. But um, so they're pretty delicate, but once they're on the wall, they're they're pretty solid. 